Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Greetings in the name of Christ. As brothers and sisters in him, let us rejoice together in our worship of God. Please feel welcomed and wanted as we lift up our hearts to our creator. My name is not Kathy Harple. I am Kathy Welch. Uh, Kathy is not feeling well this morning, so we send our prayers for healing to her and apologize for the delay this morning. Uh, children do begin today in worship. Grade four receive their gift Bibles during worship, and then all the children will go to their classrooms. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Please fill out one of the welcome cards in the pew in front of you and place it in the offering plate later in the service. We welcome all those who are worshiping with us online this morning. We also ask that you check your cell phones and all other electronic devices and turn them off or silence them during our worship service. For those joining our worship service online, you can find an order of worship for this morning's service on our church's website. Does anyone have an announcement today? Carol, yes. I would bring your attention to the notice of the fair in the bulletin. Um, the fair is uh, two weeks away on November 5th, and it's in the bulletin two times in two different places with some suggestions of how you can help now. Um, the other thing I would like to remind you is if you ordered an apple pie, you could pick it up today. They're frozen downstairs in the freezer. Um, I'll be down there with sheets to check you off and also sign up sheets for the fair. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, you may notice that the temperature here in the sanctuary is not as comfortable as it will be in coffee hour when you get downstairs later. Uh, we have, we are the, uh, the blower motor for the boiler, which heats this part of the building, is being replaced right now. So if it's not warm now, it will be next Sunday. <laughs> or maybe even later today. <clears throat> and I apologize. Sit close together. Um, I just want to mention quickly that the uh, Oasis... Youth group is going to be doing something called a rake and run this afternoon. So they're meeting at the Spring Glen Church um, uh, at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and I also want to mention that I will be um, away next Sunday. I'll be away at the end of the week, leaving on Thursday. So... There will be a guest preacher, Milton Brasher Cunningham, will be coming to preach next Sunday. And as usual, uh, there will be uh, someone covering the church for emergency pastoral needs. So uh, please just, if that should uh, be of a uh, need of yours, please just call the church and leave a message and someone will follow up with you. Thank you. I call your attention to the other announcements in the bulletin today. And we thank those for participating in this morning's service. The fellowship hour is hosted by the Generosity Mission Team. And we stand to extend a special welcome to our guest organist this morning, Jörg Ogenfuss. Um, we're very happy to have him back. Today's flowers are given in the spirit of generosity. Generous God, we come today to recommit ourselves to your covenant, to be your people and your people alone. We come ready to worship you fully with all that we are and all that we have faithfully. As we, as we begin this season of generosity, may the nourishment that comes most fully at this sacred table inspire our own depth of faith and generosity. Amen. 
May we have a moment of silence to prepare for worship.
please join me in the responsive call to worship found in your order of service. Listen, Jesus is standing at the door. Help us to be earnest and repent. If we open the door, Jesus will come to us. Knowing that he only disciplines and reproves those whom he loves. Jesus wants to eat with us, to invite us once again to the table. May we hear the call. May we open the door. May we accept the invitation to eat with our Savior. Let us pray together for peace. Almighty God, guide the nations of the world into ways of justice and truth, and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness and the sharing of grace, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let the design of your great love Shine on the waste of our wraths and sorrows. Give peace to your church, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts through your dear Son. Amen. Please join with me in the unison prayer of invocation. Holy Spirit, we seek inspiration from the early church to truly be together as the family of God. Help us to seek out the ways we are alike in our desire to be faithful to you in all we do. May this time of worship Remind us to live as if your realm is already among us, where all have a genuine place of belonging and are valued for who we are rather than for what we have. May our time together be a celebration of the real presence of Jesus among us and the resurrection power of the church still in the world. Amen. And let us continue together in prayer, offering our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, printed in your order of service. children in the church, uh, and we usually do that in the year that they're in fourth grade. So we have two <coughs> children to whom we're giving Bibles today, two young people. Uh, one is Gabriella DeLuca, if you would come. And the other one is uh, Noah. Noah, which is very good because there's a passage. 
Noah's grandfather. Yeah, really, you have to stay up. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so. This, this is, is Noah right. Jones. Just think about him as Noah Jones. Okay, so. This is your Bible. And in there are marked two verses that I felt are important, particularly for young people to know. All right? So the first one comes from the very first book in the Bible. It's in the book of Genesis. And it's right at the end of the story of Noah that we sort of probably know about and we've heard about. The story of the building of the ark and when it rained for such a long time and then all the animals were saved because Noah built the ark and took the animals on there and took some of his family there. And so when the flood finally went away, they could come out and start filling up the world with animals again, right? But at the very end of the story is a passage that talks about God promising people that there would never be another terrible flood that covered the whole world like this again. And God said that that was such an important promise that there should be a sign that people could see and recognize the sincerity and the, and the truthfulness and the steadfastness of God's promise. You know what the sign is? The sign is the rainbow. Right? So if you read the story, here's what it sounds like. This is God speaking. <clears throat> I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me the earth. When I bring clouds on the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So that's the first passage with the yellow marker. The second passage with the pink marker comes from the gospel according to Matthew. Okay. So we already talked a little about when Jesus called the children, right? And the disciples said, go away. But Jesus said, no, no, let them come. So this is a part of that passage from Matthew 18, 1 through 5. So at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he had put among them and said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now, those are very nice, brand new Bibles. They sort of, the cover sort of is still tight when you try to open it up, right? The pages are sort of crisp, okay? It shouldn't stay like that, all right? We want you to use these Bibles to read them. You can write notes in there, you can put bookmarks in there. Whatever you need to do to remember, whatever you find in there that's important and special to you. Because part of our gift to you of this Bible is a promise that we make, which is if you wear out the Bible, we'll give you another one. So, just in case you don't know like what a worn out Bible looks like, this is one that someone gave you. They wanted to replace it, right? Look, the, crack, the cover's about to come off. It is coming off on this side, right? And the pages, some of the pages are all scrunched up in here. So, that's what we want to have happen with your Bible. We want you to read it, make notes, put in bookmarks, whatever you need to be able to find it and read what you want and read what you want to share with your family. And if it gets to be a little worn out, bring it back and we'll give you another one. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, you have given us the gift of your word and through the ages in the church, we have received this word and we have read together and studied and listened as we seek to follow in the way that you would lead us. So we ask your blessing upon these two new Bibles and those who will be reading and studying them, Gabriella and Noah. We pray that you bless 
them in their leading and in their understanding and in their faithful service and discipleship. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. first lesson this morning is taken from the book of the gospel according to Revelation, reading from the third chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe yourself and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you, and you with me. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I invite all who are able to stand and join in singing our hymn as we gather at your table. <laughs>
The second lesson this morning is taken from the book of Acts, reading from the second chapter, beginning at the 43rd verse. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O God of holiness and steadfast love, we come into your presence today to listen to your word, to receive your wisdom, to hear your call, and to hope and to pray that through the work of your Holy Spirit we will be transformed. and that our lives will be dedicated in faithful discipleship. Be with us now as we listen and respond. Amen. So we have been celebrating the season of generosity in October, and the theme for that celebration has been from bread and cup to faith and giving, thinking particularly about the sacrament of communion and its place in our fellowship, in our life of faith, and what it symbolizes for us and what it calls us to do. So every Sunday we've sung a different hymn uh, related to the celebration of communion, a hymn often sung in preparation for that celebration which for us happens on the first Sunday of each month and on a couple of other holidays, uh, Holy Thursday being one of them. <clears throat> and the lessons that we have heard have all touched to some, in some way on the feeding of God's people as a part of the life of faith. So... Today, on Generosity Sunday, as we prepare to present our gifts and our pledges of financial support and uh, the gifts of our time and our talent in the coming year, we are presented with two stories from the scripture that give two distinct pictures of the life of the church and the life of discipleship. The first comes from the last book in the Bible, the Revelation to John, sometimes just called uh, Revelation. And the passage that we heard comes from the third chapter. Now, the book of Revelation is filled with descriptions of, of dreams and vision and fantastic images. But in the chapters two and three, it consists of letters to seven churches um, in that time. And of the seven churches, two receive a letter that commends them for their faithful living. But the other five receive letters that point out to them their failures in discipleship and urge them to repent and change their ways. And perhaps most interesting among them is the story of the church of Laodicea, which is the one that we heard this morning. Now, before, before I talk about that passage, I want you to understand, first of all, I want you to think about a painting, which you probably have seen and you probably can remember even if you don't know the name of either the artist or the painting. The artist is Werner Salman. The title of the painting is Christ at Heart's Door. But it's a picture of Jesus in a long, flowing, kind of glowing robe with a gentle look on his face and his hand raised at a wooden door, gently knocking. You've probably seen that picture before, sometime. It's an image of Jesus knocking at a door, hoping to be invited in. So you should know that the book of Revelation was written in the very first century uh, after Jesus' life. Um, It was written in Asia Minor. It's it's focused on Asia Minor, the area that we now think of as uh, Turkey, mostly. Um, And Domitian was the emperor of Rome at that time. 
And what had happened was that Ro the Roman Empire was, uh, was passing very heavy taxes that the people were responsible, responsible for. And they had a, a very clear and arduous class system that divided people into different groups with uh, varying levels of rights uh, or abilities to participate in society. Um, there were shrines to Roman gods that were put up by the emperor and by the government, and it was demanded that everyone uh, pay homage and give recognition to those shrines, which of course is a direct violation of our understanding of, of our covenant with God who says that we are not to worship idols, but that there should be for us only one God. And so the power of the vision and, and the book of Revelation is to encourage the community to hold on to its faith and perhaps even to back up a bit, to separate a little bit from the effort of the society to somehow twist or manipulate or, or entangle their faithfulness and their discipleship in ways that will take them further away from God and make it harder for them to recognize and feel and share the promises of God. So each of the churches that John writes about has an angel that looks over them and mediates between them and God. And the message that comes to the church of Laodicea says that it's a church that's neither cold, like ours, or hot. It's lukewarm. And the angel says that God's message is because they're lukewarm, they're just... They're just somehow offensive to God, that they're liable to be spit out. The angel says, what you like to talk about is that you are rich, that you have prospered, and that there's nothing that you need beyond what you have provided for yourself. Now, Laodicea was a very wealthy community. It prospered because of its uh, industries and its, and its trade. And in fact, it was so wealthy that there had been a terrible earthquake in the city. And the city was totally rebuilt by the inhabitants without taking any assistance from the government because they had the means and the savings accumulated to do that. So what John and the angel say that God is paying attention to is that they have somehow arrived at an understanding that they don't really need God so much anymore. God might be worthy of, of a nod, a passing nod of acquaintance, but, but they're able to take care of themselves. They're able to provide for themselves and their families, and it's an illusion. It's an illusion that they're somehow secure all by themselves, that they have no need for faith or a relationship with God. The angel points out that instead of being secure in all their fine clothing and their comfort, they are in fact naked before God. And would do better to just put on humble white robes and acknowledge that they have wandered from what God has asked of them. And they have focused all their energy and attention on accumulating wealth and honor and prestige among the rest of the city rather than serving God and attending to those at the edges of the society, the last and the least. And then the passage ends with this verse. Listen, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice 
open the door. I will come in with you. And you with, I will come in and eat with you. And you with me. So, this is not one of those terrible report cards that ends with the idea of maybe you should just give up and drop out. There's no hope. It ends instead with the idea that God still wants to come in, even into that lukewarm church, to be with the people there, to help them feel the power of God's promise, what the difference that God's new life can be. And so that whole picture of a lukewarm church is contrasted with the description from the book of Acts of the, of the earliest church. In the days just following Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, just when the disciples were beginning to take seriously their commission to carry the gospel and the promise of Jesus out into the surrounding countryside and communities. And there's the description of the community. And it says that, it's remarkable. It says that there were lots of wonders and signs being seen. Everyone who was there together believed together. They had kept all their things in common. Day by day, as they spent time together, they broke bread at home. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. So this is a community where the presence of God is, is constant. And the result is gratitude and joy and fellowship. And the recognition of the possibility of sharing and inviting others to come and to join the fellowship and to join the celebration and to join the discipleship. And the last word of this story is, and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So two pictures. Both of them, including a God who yearns to be with God's people, who yearns to be in the midst of the gathered fellowship, part of the gratitude and the celebration and the joy, bringing a promise of the faith and the strength and the courage and the hope and the joy that will allow them to go out into the community to share with others and bring them back to join in the ministry and the mission. And so today, we are asked to make commitments for the support of this church and its ministry and mission in the coming year. To provide gifts that will help with the financial support of the church and also to provide time and talent that will contribute to the ministry, to the mission, to the contact with the community, whether it's with distributing food or working on a home with habitat or providing, helping to provide the space that community groups come and use here in order that they can pursue their journey of sobriety or share the wonder of music with young children and their parents or perhaps to help with hosting or feeding, sheltering people who are living in the winter without adequate shelter. So I invite your prayer and I invite your prayer with all hope that we will not be a lukewarm church. We'll just go from cold to warm. 
without lingering in the middle. And that our mission and ministry together in the coming year will bring to each one of us the joy of fellowship and the promise of new life, not only for us, but for all those with whom we share. Amen. Let me invite us together now into a time of prayer. I invite you to take a deep breath. To attend to what fills your heart in this moment. We want to give thanks for the flowers on the communion table, sharing the spirit of generosity this morning. We want to offer prayers for those who are named in our order of worship, for Ellen Robert and Joyce Bolaño, for Marsha Folds and Shirley Ryan, for Linda Shannon and Marlene Bolaño. We wish a happy birthday this morning. Uh, in the coming week, to Gracie Kirk, to Carson Lairzaf, to Matthew DeVito, and to Betsy Reed. We want to lift up prayers for those among our congregation, our families, and our acquaintances who are living with cancer. And so we lift up in prayer Roy and Chris, Nolan and Janet, Joseph and Elaine, Debbie, Marsha, Anna, Jordan and her father, Sarah and Misty, Annie and Barbara and Jackie. Tim Pfeiffer asks that we lift up, continue to offer prayers for his brother Bob, who's been hospitalized. He was moved to an ICU for continued treatment for his heart and blood pressure this week. And so we lift up prayers for Bob and for his family and for Tim. I invite you to lift up prayers of thanksgiving for the life of Sarah Noyes, who died on October the 10th. Sarah was the wife of John Noyes, who has played here in our sanctuary, uh, played the trumpet for a number of uh, Easter's in recent years. I invite us to lift up with thanksgiving the precious lives of Ed and Ruth Dudley, who were laid to rest in a graveside ceremony in Guilford on Wednesday. Ed and Ruth were longtime dedicated members of this church, and they died in the fall of 2019. Mabel Peterson asks for prayers of thanksgiving for the life of her brother-in-law, Stuart LaRock, uh, who lives in British Columbia, who passed away on Monday uh, the 17th. Prayers for God's comfort for her sister Eunice and her family. She also asks prayers for her friend Anne Bliss in the Essex Meadow Rehab Center. Anne was diagnosed with COVID and is still recovering from pneumonia and anemia. And also continued prayers for Paul and Carol Connor. Paul is Mabel's son Matthew's father-in-law, who is in the advanced stage of ALS and is being cared for at home by Carol, his wife. I invite your prayers for John and Linda Rankin. John is now in home hospice care, and Linda is at the Masonic Care Health Care Center. And I want to uh, acknowledge what all of us have experienced this week uh, in the grief following the deaths of uh, Officer Alex Hamsey and Sergeant Dustin DeMonte in a terrible, tragic, evil shooting in Bristol. So I invite us to hold their families and their colleagues in our prayers. And I also invite us to lift up prayers for those members of this congregation who are police officers or emergency responders or who have police officers or emergency responders uh, in their family. Let's begin our prayer in silence. O God of love and grace and truth and righteousness, we thank you for your word which comes to us through your scriptures, through your spirit, and through the wisdom that is shared with us 
by your faithful followers. We thank you for the gift of this church and your calling to be disciples in the world, sharing the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, with all whom we meet. We pray that you will hear all of our prayers this morning, those spoken and those offered in silence, and that you will grant us trust, faithful trust, in your healing power and in your light, and that you will grant to us sufficient wisdom and hope for our journey of discipleship in the coming days. We offer this prayer in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join in 
share with me in a greeting of peace and to carry that greeting throughout this week. May the peace of God and Jesus Christ be with you all of us. Our hymn is O Holy City, Scene of John, number 709. May you go from this place with attentive hearts, listening for Jesus' knock at the door, ready to answer. And may you go knowing that you are the church, not this building. And may you be the church by praising God in all ways. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the deep peace of the Holy Spirit fill you and abide with you this day and every day. Amen. You may be seated.